Russ says it didn't impede your career success. Well, that's very kind of Russ to say. And um, I really feel like there's a lot of us that are very driven people to begin with. And when you're that way, you end up finding ways to, how do I unwind quickly? And for me, it was like, well, I should have a hobby or maybe I should do something else. But alcohol was just the easiest thing to do. And it was perfectly acceptable in my family. Growing up, that was kind of how my family members, my dad and my brothers communicated. And I wanted to be just like them. What we don't realize is there's all kinds of families going through this, but we're taught not to talk about it. This is Emily Harmon, host of the Onward podcast, and Jenny Clark is my guest today. Jenny is the Oprah of federal contracting. She's the founder of GovCon Summit, a virtual accelerator network for small businesses in federal contracting, especially veteran entrepreneurs who hire veterans. Jenny has helped thousands of businesses navigate the federal market. She's introduced them to agencies, teammates, and primes. She helps them by solving complex issues with her team of subject matter experts that are in the GovCon space, and she connects them with veteran entrepreneurs for unique guidance. And she also guides them in the financial logistics of federal contracting. Jenny and I aren't here today to talk about federal contracting. In this episode, we are celebrating 30 years of sobriety for Jenny. This interview was conducted on the 28th of January and published live on LinkedIn, YouTube, and in the Onward Movement Facebook group, and now I'm publishing it as a regular Onward podcast episode. I really want this episode to reach thousands and thousands of people. If you could help by sharing it, I'd greatly appreciate it. I'm sure that we all know somebody who is impacted by alcoholism. In this episode, Jenny is very open about her journey, and she also offers several times to help others out. So realize you are not alone. Reach out to Jenny if you need somebody to talk to. Jenny, (laughs) welcome to another episode of the Onward Podcast. We're live this time, and we're celebrating your birthday. I know. I'm so excited, Emily. That you're having me on for my birthday. And, you know, when we say it's 30 years, everybody's like, I think she's older than 30. And they're absolutely right. But they say when you're an alcoholic that you stop maturing at the age at which you start drinking. And so I'm really much younger than you think I am. (laughs) But um, yeah, you're right. This is 30 years. And I can remember the day that I was finally successful to say, now I can stop. Because it was a really rough, set of years to go through that. And every year at, at, um, you know, the new year's resolution would always be let's stop drinking. But I finally did it one year on the 28th by the 28th. So, you know, it's like no judging, just do it. Yeah. But how hard was that to stop? Well, it was hard because it was a lifestyle that I'd already always grown up with. And people don't mind that you have one or two drinks. And it wasn't, I think that there are a lot of people that are very high functioning because that's their personality. And it's almost like it's so immediate, the effects of alcohol. It's so accessible. And it's like, I'm just going to have something to drink. And I think the difference with people that are alcoholic, and I prefer to think of it as a disease because that's just easier for me. It's easier for me to say that. And um, where other people have a couple of drinks and stop, after I've had a couple of drinks, it's like, I still want more. I still want more. And you would do that with some things, but eventually you'd stop eating chocolate, right? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I guess I would. <laughs> I know. It's really kind of hard to say, but I just felt like I had to figure out what it was. And they say that when it starts interfering with your life. And it did start interfering with my life and it had for a long time because it almost made me question, am I crazy? Why do I do this? Is it willpower? What's wrong with me? And it wasn't always uncontrollable, but it was always like I felt better with it than I did without it. So when did you when did you realize it was a problem and when did you admit to yourself that it was a problem? I probably realized it in college because there weren't that many people that enjoyed it as much as I did. And then I would look around and say, well, my friend does it this way. And I don't want to say that that person is an alcoholic. My family members do this. I don't want to say they're alcoholic. And so I was kind of like judging myself compared to other people that were doing the exact same thing, which is just like, you know, I know you've talked many times about you can join a gym, but you have to go inside. Yeah. 
And if you want to get better at anything, you have to hang out with people that set those kind of goals. And I was setting goals not for figuring out what was missing in my life or what I needed to do or something like that. I was looking for ways that I would get stressed out at the end of the day, come home, have dinner, do whatever I needed to do. And um, then I might have a couple of drinks, but I've gotten to the point, and this is toward the end where I would have vodka in my diet Sprite can thinking I was fooling somebody with that. Mm -hmm. Just, it was more of that thing. It was like, I'd wake up in the morning with a headache and wonder why, why I did that to myself. And there were times where I didn't drink too much, but it was still something that if I didn't have it every day, I was like, I would feel so much better if I just had a drink. Were you like rip roaring drunk or were you still, you know, I was staying home and things like that, reading a book or watching TV or something like that. And then I would just go to sleep. And, you know, I think the other thing is a lot of people that are drinkers kind of have rules Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of patterns around this. And there are patterns that show up in other people's lives as well. Mm -hmm. Um, They call them the geographic cure. When I move to a new place, I'll stop. Or when I do this, I'll change my life. And it's really just like the balance wheel we talked about last night. Well, Russ says it didn't impede your career success. Well, that's very kind of Russ to say. And um, I really feel like there's a lot of us that are very driven people to begin with. And when you're that way, you end up finding ways to, how do I unwind quickly? And for me, it was like, well, I should have a hobby or maybe I should do something else. But alcohol was just the easiest thing to do. And it was perfectly acceptable in my family. Growing up, that was kind of how my family members, my dad and my brothers communicated. And I wanted to be just like them. I wanted to be able to keep up with them. And there were so many times where I felt like they were accepting of me and it would get rid of my nerves and stuff like that. Or when I would go in college, go to a party or something like that. It was like, I always felt a lot better if I had a drink before I went. And then, you know, it's like you stop, you stop counting. You're like, well, that was a lot. So not by standards, you know, what are your thoughts on the term functioning alcoholic? Well, there are a lot of us that are functioning alcoholics and a functioning (laughs) alcoholic pretty much figures out a way to navigate alcohol into their routine so carefully that it doesn't break other things. And as I said, I said, well, I did it at night. I wouldn't go out, things like that. And to me, it was like, it was just a habit, but it's, it's not a habit in the same sense of, I think it was probably harder to quit smoking than it was to quit drinking, but nobody really likes smokers anymore. Yeah. Yeah. But drinkers are pretty fun people a lot of times until they're right. not. Right. I mean, it's cool to drink, right? I mean, wh- wh- whenever you go to a restaurant, what's the first thing they ask you? Yeah, what would you like to drink? And I can remember being embarrassed and saying, well, what if people notice I'm not drinking? And these are like the crazy ideas that go through your head. And I finally had to come up with what is going to be my ticket out? What am I going to do to forgive myself or say that this is not just about willpower? And um, it took a long time. I went to therapist over years and I'd say, I just don't feel good. I'm down a lot. I'm not getting where I want to get. And seven, eight years of that, none of them ever asked me, do you think you drink too much? Had they asked me that, I would have said no. Right. But it would have put put a little bug in your ear. Well, it definitely would. Mm -hmm. And then finally, one day I went to a different one and she asked me and she said, well, I'm an alcoholic. And I'm like, you're an alcoholic. You look so smart. You look so successful. You look so happy. How could you be an alcoholic? She said, well, I am. There's a lot of us. We don't talk about it when we're on the other side. We don't talk about it while we're drinking because it's like, we don't know what goes on in other people's homes or families or anything like that. And so we kind of assume we're the only ones, but I walked into different meetings and I was like, these are some super high powered people. And when they would sit there and and admit where they were in their journey, it gave me the power to do it. It made me keep showing up. And that's really, the first thing is you have to stop drinking. And every morning I'd wake up and say, well, tonight I'm not going to have anything. I'm not going to have anything. One day at a time, right? Yeah. And I can remember going to meetings, which are really like, I will tell you, these meetings are the cheapest therapy you can ever get. Because you're sitting around with a lot of other people that totally accept you. And you don't know that when you first walk in. But just think about how many situations that everybody walks in where they feel uncomfortable. Some people say, well, I don't like to go to parties. I'm introverted or I don't want to participate with other sports. And what we end up doing is creating a smaller world for ourselves. And alcohol for me was just like a fence like anything else. It said stay in this circle. 
So let me ask you this question because um, people are probably thinking it. Why aren't you ashamed to say that you're an alcoholic? Well, it took me a long time to get over it because I didn't want to tell people about it and I didn't want people to know. And I think that's part of the embarrassment because you feel like if you admit it, you have a problem, then people are going to look down on you. And your family members are really part of the worst. I can remember having conversations with my parents or my brothers. I said, I think maybe this is, you know, maybe I should stop drinking. And my dad would say, you're just a social drinker like me. And, and on the other side of adulthood, I was like, no way he was a social drinker. But for him, that was his social practice. And that's mm-hmm. what I grew up with. And the main thing that I felt like in the end, I decided I am not going to pass this on to my daughters. Because it really is, some people, for some people, it's a lifestyle. For some people, maybe it's genetic that we have more of a tendency to drink, think, take alcohol differently. It might be that that's kind of the way your family and your friends socialize and you want to be friends with them, and you just kind of slide into it, and then you wake up years later, and like, I knew in college I need to make this change, but I kept talking to people, and I was, instead of making my own decisions, or I would kind of choose what I wanted to think about, and that's what they call mm-hmm. denying. Whatever you're going to do, it's like, well, I will, I will make this change at some point in the future, but right, right now, I don't really need to do it. I'm not that bad. For somebody watching who's living with somebody that's an alcoholic, one thing that I would say is the person that's suffering from alcoholism needs to understand that that's the issue. Because if they don't, you can't make somebody else get sober. They have to want to themselves, right? Or to do something about it. Exactly. And you're also talking about if I was... As an alcoholic, when I was actively drinking, if somebody said to me, Jenny, you're drinking a lot, I go, that's pretty judgmental of you. I'm not hurting anybody, but I was because I was emotionally checked out of the relationship. Russ says, you you know, things went well at work and everything. Okay. They very well may be going well at work, but at home behind the scenes, there's some issues. I mean, I know I was married to one and my son was one. And so people don't see that. Well, and I think the other thing is a lot of times the partner in the relationship feels sorry or wishes there was something different, but it's almost like there's nothing that partner can do about that alcoholic. And I think that is the hardest part of it because I'd seen my mother dealing with my father, who was a heavy drinker, whether he said it was social or not. I know that she covered for a lot of things for him all the time. And so it it almost became like, this is our family secret, Jenny. We don't talk about it. So I never want to hear you talk about it. And it made me say, oh, well, I guess that's what I'm supposed to do. Not to blame my mother, who is, who's a gem, but right. it's, It's like we as individuals have to take responsibility. And when we've grown up in society and family where it says, hey, let's have some beers, let's have a glass of wine, let's go out to dinner and all this, we we create patterns and they're very hard to break those patterns. And how do you do that, Christy? Well, yeah, Christy says, happy 30th. How do you handle it now if somebody wants, so let's say we're at GovCon, your summit that you're putting on, and there's a reception in the evening. I know we're not going to be able to do it in person this year, but should f- people feel like, ooh, Jenny's here. I don't know that I can drink. Well, that's re- that's really funny that you would ask it. As you remember last year at GovCon, which it was in Tampa, March 11th and 12th, days before Corona shut us down, yeah. I can remember the previous week, finding out that our sponsors weren't going to be able to show up because they were shut down. And we had a reception that they paid for. They could not attend. And we had Corona beer. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> I remember. Now, I did not. They named a drink after me. And I don't remember what it was, but I couldn't drink that drink, but I didn't tell them. What I ended up having to do is come up with things where I could feel comfortable not making other people uncomfortable about me not drinking. Yeah. And I worried a lot about how they felt, but I generally speaking would always have a Diet Coke with me, regardless of where I was. I would always have a can of Diet Coke or something with me. Yeah. And the other thing is you can always get a soda water and tonic or something with lime and things or a Coke with lime in it. People don't know and they don't really care. And I think that's the hardest part to remind yourself is they really don't care. But I'll also tell you, I'm online dating again. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. I've done it, you know, several years ago and it's, it's not easy to get over, but once you get over the thing of saying I'm attached to the outcome of whether this person likes me or doesn't like me, I'm just going to have a good time and I'll be super surprised if anything comes of this. I quit putting on my profile that I did not drink because nobody would date me if I didn't drink, which is really funny. So now what I do is I put social and I usually don't tell people that I don't drink 
until I've been around them a few times. Yeah. And like, oh my gosh, you should have told me I shouldn't have drank in front of you. Like, doesn't matter. It doesn't bother me at all. Some people can't be around that. Some people have a different reaction to it. I can still taste the, I can still in my mind, imagine the taste of scotch or daiquiris, or any, or wine, or any of these things. And once in a while, I even have something that I call a drunk dream, where I wake up, and I've been at a party, I'm vacationing, or something like that, and I go, I had punch, and it had alcohol in it. And then I wake up the next morning and think, thank gosh, that did not happen. (laughs) Gratitude is a big part of everything we do, and being grateful for every day with a clear head, and determining you're going to put one foot in front of the other. But, you know, I think you're absolutely right, Emily, about this. Whatever relationships you're in, if you've got people that are struggling with drugs or alcohol, you have to protect yourself. And that is really harder to do because who else is going to reach out for your son? Who else is going to stand by him? And there's so many families struggling with this. And I think back to, well, just think about it, Betty Floor Clinic. People did not talk about alcoholism. And then she did talk about it and had to go through whatever she had to go through. She was a brave woman because nobody wants to talk about this stuff. Nobody yeah, does. Yeah. You can um, see I'm starting to tear up because you said my son. I know. And- I started not to look back at you because I know it's difficult, isn't it? To think back. Yeah, it really is. And he's four years sober and he's doing great. But I think I have PTSD from it. <laughs> well, I think you do because there's always that feeling as a parent or loved one, is it something I did? And it's not anything that parent or loved one has done. And We have to decide at some point what we need to do to protect ourselves and protect our family members. And I think that was the reason when I woke up one day and realized what I'd done. I was home by my, I was home with my girls. My um, husband had taken somebody to the airport and um, we went that morning to something. I don't know, but I was really not prepared to take care of my children. Oh, wow. And I just said, this is it. I'm not going to do this. And I think that that's what we're all asking everybody to think about is what can you do to break the pattern in your life, whether it's alcohol or whatever your challenge is. And I will tell you, it was hard that I had to go every day to a meeting and they say like 90 meetings in 90 days. And there's so many people that say, oh, I don't need that. I can quit on my own. But it's very hard to do just by the force of willpower because everything you do in your life is that... It's just as hard as me not having ice cream, except ice cream may make me fat, but it doesn't make me disruptive and crazy. And by that, I really mean when they say that you can tell when alcohol starts to interfere in your life, you're like, well, I've got it all worked out. So it doesn't interfere. And I wanted to say also, Emily, that I think that you're having conversations with a lot of different people that are really talking about, hey, I had to hide behind this. In my career for the longest time, I had to keep it from my family. I had to keep secrets. We all did because it was too much of a threat to our career and our status and everything else. And when you look around and ask yourself, is there somebody in our sphere that's going to contact me after this event and say, Jenny, I'd love to talk to you. I would love to talk to them because everybody I talk to, whether it's transition or whatever, says, if I could save somebody else that heartache, I would. Definitely. Definitely. That's one of the reasons why you, you're like, Emily, it's my 30 year and I want to be live and I want to talk about it. And you were a little nervous because you didn't want to make it all about you. But you said, I don't want to make it like all about, look at me, look at me. But you know that this is going to hit home for somebody and maybe it'll help somebody. Well, and the other thing is um, my dad, my mom, and I have four brothers and my two, two of my brothers were alcoholics. And my dad drank heavily and it was always like, that was how our family communicated and fit in. We talked about cars. We talked about basketball. My dad was a big golfer and things like that. And it's like, you do things in families to not rock the boat. And it was just kind of an easy way to to do that. And if you think about it, there's so many families where this is a pattern that they've been raised in. You know, when you're 12, 13, 14 years old, you don't know what drunk means. And you don't know that a couple of scotches in the evening is probably not a problem, but it's the, it's when people come over and are being entertained. And I can remember some really wild parties at my, at my parents' house when my dad was an officer in the Navy and would host people from his squadron or whatever. And of course, at that age, we always say that, well, people drank a lot more back then. Mm-hmm. I don't think so. I think we drink silently now and yeah. we say, oh, we drink the finest wines, you know, or something like that. But well, it, it's definitely a lifestyle. 
Yeah. And like, just to describe a, a functioning alcoholic and may he rest in peace. I mean, I feel a little bad, but I want people to know what it's like. You know, my former, my kid's dad, my former husband passed away, but every night, six beers, six or seven beers every night. It got to the point where I couldn't stand to hear the beer can open. And if we would go on a trip, like to visit my parents, we'd have to bring a cooler of beer so that he could drink it once we got there. That is a problem. Functioning, okay, being able to go to work still, but also if the kids go over on the weekend to visit, you know he's not, he was careful. He wouldn't leave the house any after like six or seven because that's when he's going to start having his drinks. But that's part of what it's like and it's really stressful. And But I couldn't make him get help. He had to realize it himself. Well, and the other part about it is in his mind, it wasn't a problem. And what I realized finally for me is I was being really selfish by wanting to do this and thinking that I'm not having any impact on other people. And I tried to make my impact as small as possible, but it still it was still there. And you give a very good example. When I ask people to talk, think about their alcohol, I think about who do you hang out with and what do you guys like to do? Mm-hmm. And they start saying, well, we like to go watch the game at the restaurant. Well, they're watching the game at the bar. Okay. Mm-hmm. The more you hang around with people that that's their thing they like to do, that's what you're going to do. And it becomes, it becomes part of your lifestyle instead of having a healthy lifestyle of saying, well, we go biking every Saturday morning and that's what we do for fun. But I've traveled with people that had that and, and I had a good friend and we took a trip up there. And as we went up there, I knew exactly how much alcohol she had packed with her. And I knew that every time we'd turn around, we'd have to stop by someplace And the only reason we had to stop by is to restock. Right. And I realized the pattern. I thought I may not be drinking, but I'm living in a setting where I'm isolating from people that I need to be associated with because it bothered me. I was drawn into somebody else's accommodating lifestyle. Right. And that was my own fault. Well, people think alcoholic, somebody who's raging drunk all the time. That's not a typical alcoholic. I mean, that's right. And there's so many people that say, well, you know, if you drink a fifth or something like that, but there's so many of us that have four to six drinks in an evening or something like that. And probably two is about right. Once you get to three, like I'm cruising. And then you get to the point where I want to maintain this feeling that I have that makes it easy euphoria or whatever. Now, alcohol is a depressant, but it doesn't feel that way when you're drinking. Mm-hmm. The other thing is there's a fabulous book out there called Under the Influence. You can go to um, out on Amazon or whatever. It's just Under the Influence. But I read this book and it described the physical effects of alcohol, how it's a depressive, how it's a progressive ID- disease. The more that you do it, the more that you get. But the only way to stop it is to stop drinking. And that's like, well, I would be giving up my friends. Mm-hmm. I might be changing my habits. I like the way I'm living. I don't want to make changes in my life, but it really does take that kind of commitment. And my goal would be to talk to people, especially we talk to so many veterans and veteran families. And of course, I'm from a military family. And I just want people to feel like if they want to help, want help to break the pattern, I would love to talk to them. I may not be able to talk to somebody that's drinking into stopping drinking, but maybe we could give someone some encouragement to say, I'm going to make a different choice. Alcohol because makes you fat. Okay, that may that may be true, but it may not be something that would stop somebody. <laughs> well, that that's true, and and people, it's not a logical choice. That's the other thing in the book Under the Influence. It just talks about not everybody reacts to alcohol in this way. People that have there's not an alcoholic drink. Gee, I wished there was. I could take a blood test, and then I would say, well. Nobody has to make the decision for me whether I'm an alcoholic or not. I have to make that decision. But I thought if they had a skin prick or something, then I would go take that and I would say, okay, now I'll give up. I wouldn't have. That wasn't what made me give up. But yeah. it really is a pattern and it's it's the sugar coming into your system and it's just that feeling of everything else. Now, the other thing is people say, well, now that you could go to Colorado and get high, would you want to do that? And I'm like, I think that's an addictive personality trait that I shouldn't get into. And I'm probably not going to do that because I would just go down that. It's the feeling of euphoria that you're going for. And if I started trying it with a drug or cannabis or something like that, I would go back exactly where I was. And you don't want to do that. Right, right. Because people arrange their lives around 
wanting access to alcohol, wanting not to be bothered by about alcohol. And the thing that I look at, and part of the reason we're doing what we're doing and, and all the, the stuff you've been doing on Onward Movement and Onward Podcasts, really asking people that are willing to be open about their challenges and what they did to overcome it is so important because people need to feel like they're not the only one in the world and they don't need to hide from that. For me, I think alcohol was, I was self-medicating. And now that I'm not drinking, as I got older and went through certain phases of my life, I went to a doctor and they said, you know, I can give you some medicine for that. I was like, what? I've been going to talk therapy for four years and you're telling me that I should consider this alternative. So there's Prozac, there's um, a lot of different ones, but I've actually been on that for many years. And during this time that we've had these challenges, I upped my dosage. Not everybody's body produces the same amount of the right hormones to keep you moving. And it could be that I could solve this by eating better or whatever. But for a lot of people, alcohol's first step is it's self-medicating and it makes us feel good. And you, if you go to the doctor, it was like the other day I ran out of pills. And I was like, crud, I got to go back to the doctor and I, wanna, I don't want to take the time. I don't want to talk to her about any of this. And alcohol is just so much easier. Yeah. And so I really do think that we've learned a lot more about mental health. We've learned a lot more about it in emotional intelligence and emotional balance. But the main thing is we're working in stress, stress lives. We're not leaving enough time to go biking or go hiking or do whatever, take time off, go reading. And because of that, we turn to these instant solutions. Yeah, and- I reserve a glass of wine at the end of my back-to-back Zoom meetings. Let me have some wine and watch Netflix and just zoom out and still be not in touch with my feelings and wake up the next day and do it all over again. Right. And that's what you're talking about with Onward Movement is what do you want to do to change your movement so you're moving in the in the direction you choose instead of your default? Because I feel like that's where we are these days. And I would encourage anybody that wants to speak with me to reach out to me. I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Jenny W. Clark, and uh, my company, Solvability. Anything that I can do to connect people to the right solutions. And, um, you know, sometimes I just feel like my job is to be that sister. This says, I listen a couple times, but after that, I'm going to say, you're on your own. Here are the steps you need to take and just be strong. Yeah, you've got to do that inner work. I would say, I mean, I'm not an alcoholic, but my addiction is being busy. And that's my way of avoiding my feelings just to get really, really busy and to create more work for myself. And like I thought it would end when I retired and I'd have all this free time, but I'm good at creating more work. And I love doing what I'm doing. But I've also learned, you and I are in some different groups together. I've also learned about how to just be, and I've learned to set boundaries. This week, I did not do a good job of that. I had too many back-to-back meetings. I've cleared a lot of my calendar for the next month so that I can do some creative stuff that I want to do with my work. But that's my drug of choice, is to just stay really busy. And then I don't have to feel my feelings, but I'm learning to feel them again. And it's it's hard, but it's good. Well, I, I had to get the list of feelings so I could start listening. I think the most powerful thing that you've done is your Facebook group with Onward Movement because so many people have joined that and realized how many other people are having the same things. And what I loved about it is today on Facebook, I think it was a picture of a baby fawn eating popcorn. Yeah. (laughs) And it's like, you go on there and you just kind of giggle and you say, I'm going to let all this stuff go. I'm just going to laugh at this picture. I'm going to take some time to write in a journal. I'm going to um, relax a little bit, maybe go for a walk. And we've got to find ways to be healthier in our choices. But I'm really proud of what you've done with the Onward Movement and the Onward Podcast because, Emily, you're taking a stand on behalf of so many other people and talking about this. And really, one of the reasons that I first noticed you is I'd met you at an event a long time ago. But you were posting on LinkedIn about the challenges with your son and being so open about it. I know that was very difficult for you because it's that helplessness, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm going to create a banner real quick. Yeah, it was. It was for 10 years that he uh, drank and did drugs. And um, he finally got sober when he was 23. And he's 27, almost 28. And he's going to school. He's studying to be an engineer. He's just doing so awesome. But I think that as a mom... It's always in the back of your mind. And I was really worried when his dad died, how that would uh, impact him. But you can go on my Onward podcast YouTube channel 
And we did a short video that summarizes my podcast episode with him that I did about what it finally took for him. It's kind of, the episode is a mother and son's discussion on addiction, I think it is, and um, what it finally took for him to just decide to go get help and how when he went to the hospital, I was in a class for senior executives, new senior executives, and I did not leave that class and go down to be at the hospital with him because I wanted to send him a signal that I knew that he could do this and he didn't need his mommy at age 23. And that was really hard to do. But in that interview, he, I'm fortunate that my son is still alive and he can tell me that the things I did right and stuff, because there are parents whose kids are, are not alive anymore. So I count my blessings every day. Well, I, I know what you're talking about, and I think there's so many stories that you brought out from the one that I listened to just the other day was with Joyce Doe, I believe. Her three right. sons passed away from heroin overdose. Yeah. What we don't realize is there's all kinds of families going through this, but we're taught not to talk about it. And the other part about it is when a family is seeking mental health, they can't afford it. No. And at the same time, you've got to get desperately ill to get checked into a rehab or something like that. And what she was talking about was trying to maintain her job, making her decisions by herself, because like you, she wasn't really getting the guidance that she wanted to from her partner. And the feeling of helplessness of every time the, the phone would ring, it was like, please come home. And it happens everywhere. And if you think about also the suicides have increased and veteran suicide and things like that, it's because we've lost our family support systems in so many ways. And the options for people are so limited when it comes to getting any kind of support with either the family has to pay for it or the person has to be way down the road bad and go through that over and over. And you've got so many episodes where you've talked to people about that. And you're really revealing to people, just like Betty Ford did, said, I'm going to do something different. And I'm sure that everybody told her, no, don't say anything. Mm -hmm. Don't say anything. We've been told that all of our lives. And I would say, let's say something. Let's say something. And I interviewed one woman, Allie Morales. I think she went to rehab 26 times before she became sober. So don't give up. So oh, yeah. happy birthday, Jenny. All right. Well, thank you, Emily. Loved being on it. And um, I cannot wait to see what you accomplish next with Onward Movement. Thank you. Thank you for listening today. And Jenny, thank you so much for sharing your journey and happy birthday. 30 years. That's amazing. It's just amazing. Congratulations. And thank you for sharing your celebration with so many people. To all of my Onward podcast listeners, thank you for listening to this episode. And I'm going to thank you in advance for sharing it. I know that there are more people out there that need to hear this episode, that need to hear that recovery is possible. And there are people that need to hear that you can create a life that you love living. In this episode, Jenny talks a few times about the Onward Movement. And the Onward Movement right now is a online community, Facebook group. However, we are going to start getting together a little bit more in person, but there's people in the Onward Movement from all over the world. So it's a great virtual place to gather and to get some support and to get some tips on how you can release the fear of judgment, embrace authenticity, and create a life that you love living and to do that with confidence. So come on over and check out the Onward Movement Facebook group. I put a link in the show notes and I hope to see you there. And once you join, or even if you don't join, feel free to schedule an introductory meeting with me. I'd love to meet my Onward podcast listeners. So there's a link for scheduling a meeting with me in the show notes as well. Thank you so much for listening and have a wonderful day.